Tonight, I'd like to start here. I'd like you to play TV executive. Now the producers have finished their signature produced video package. It's going to kick off the final round of coverage of one of the biggest sporting events of the year, the U.S. Open Golf Tournament. You, the producer, are about to watch it for final approval. See if anything jumps out at you. Here it is. I pledge I'm sorry, did I lapse into a coma there? I mean, it was very, very subtle. You, may, you might have missed it, Mr. Executive Producer. The words under God and indivisible just, uh, just magically just disappear. Needless to say, social media erupted within a short while. One of the NBC announcers was then forced to issue an apology in his best golf voice. Here it is. It was our intent to begin the coverage of this U.S. Open Championship with a feature that captured the patriotism of our national championship being held in our nation's capital for the third time. Regrettably, a portion of the Pledge of Allegiance that was in that feature was edited out. Mm. It was uh, not done to upset anyone. No. And uh, we'd like to apologize to those of you who were offended by it. I would just like to say in my best golf voice now that... Uh, uh, that uh, is the weakest apology I've ever heard. Uh, the uh, admitting under God from the pledge by admitting it. Uh, I mean, it really doesn't work. Uh, even if it uh, wasn't done to upset anyone, uh, we'd kind of like to know why it was done. What a shot. I believe that was a birdie. I actually believe them. I mean, I don't think they were trying to offend anybody. It just shows how out of touch they are with the average American. They believe, you know, oh, that, 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 you know that, that under God indivisible thing, eh, nobody's going to notice. Really? I mean, what were you trying to do? Save the extra two seconds in a three and a half hour broadcast? Here's how MSNBC's boss, Phil Griffin, uh, explained his network. MSNBC stands for something, and MSNBC is really the place to go for progressives. Oh, okay. Seeing you have the shared resources of NBC, is that what NBC is all about? I believe it is. I mean, it really shouldn't come as a surprise. Still, a lot of people were upset, but believe it or not, I actually welcome the edit. Why? Because it allows us to ask ourselves tonight this question. Are we still one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all? We find out tonight. It's like a really bad episode of The Carol Burnett Show, you know, when you're like, oh, wow, it's ending, and then you got over it. Final episode of this program is June 30th. We have nine shows remaining. We have a lot to talk about in those nine shows. By the way, hello, America. I don't know where NBC would get the idea that, you know, it's high time we start just taking under God indivisible out of the Pledge of Allegiance, you know? It's not like the president is admitting it or anything. No. I mean, okay, all right. I did forget, you know, Mr. We're all a nation of non-believers routinely left out the endowed by their creator from the line in the Declaration of Independence, but I'm sure they're completely unrelated. Tonight, we are going to focus on this idea that we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In fact, I'd, I'd like to change that from a statement to a question. Are we? Let's go through each part of it. Are we one nation anymore? I don't know. I mean, every day that goes by, I, I think less and less so. We are pitted against each other, but not in the... I mean, we always disagree with each other, and there's nothing wrong with disagreeing. But now, we're enemies. The haves against the have-nots. He's got my stuff. 
We're all socialists now, or we're teabaggers that drove America in the ditch. Part of the enlightened collectivist who wish to redistribute all the wealth, or you're just for small government. Those free from injustice, there's that half. The free from injustice of the universal health care mandates. And then the rest of us who either are small businesses or work for small businesses, whose companies will be hurt, some destroyed, because we can't get the special waivers exempting us from the White House. There are those who believe in the Constitution and those who want to make progress pass an outdated old document. Are we one nation? Are we under God? Since 1948, the number of people who say they have no religious identity has increased 500%. But are we still a nation of believers? 92% say yes, they believe in God. But do we practice that anymore? I mean, I don't mean going to church. I mean actually believe it enough to do anything with it. Have we lost our way? Have we made our God, our God the golden calf, the idol, the car, the mall, the bank accounts, the logo on your shirt, the status, the power in Congress, anything but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Many so-called believers are weak-kneed, and they remain neutral in the face of politically correct pressure, the pressure to do all kinds of things, to remove the Ten Commandments, to strike the name of God from any public place, to stop prayer in public school. A school in California recently canceled a fundraising program featuring memorial bricks because two women chose Bible verses for their inscriptions. And this weekend, the valedictorian in Vermont only delivered half of his speech because the principal instructed him to avoid all mentions of God. And now, in our best golf voice, we edit out under God indivisible from the pledge. America, people over at MSNBC, etc., will tell you that this doesn't matter. You know, what difference does it make? Many people, maybe even in this audience, will say, ah, it doesn't matter. That makes you a neutral party. But in today's world, there is no neutral. There is no neutral party. Buyer beware, God is not neutral. And neutral, if you leave it in neutral long enough, it'll start to roll down a hill. Now the next part of it is liberty. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty. I question if we're a country that even understands liberty anymore. Look what we're allowing to happen here. Government taking over GM, government forcing us to purchase something for the first time. You can't be a citizen in good standing unless you purchase a product called health care. Even children are getting physically abused during intrusive pat-downs at our airports, and nobody says anything. I'm crying because I'm just really, really upset that as an American, I have to go through this. And I do feel violated. I didn't think that I would when I had to opt out of the machine, but I completely feel violated. It could be somebody's sister. And is anybody saying anything except the great state of Texas, which tried to stand up against it, and then they were bullied, and they were told, we'll shut down all your airspace. By the way, Texas is responsible for creating nearly half of all the jobs created in America from June 2009 through April 2011. The country, despite what the president says, he didn't add $2 million jobs, we added 496,000 jobs. We've rounded it up. Now, according to the Dallas Fed, how many were created in Texas? 237,000 of those jobs. 437. 237 of them were created in Texas. The rest of them created in the other 49 states. Now, how is Texas rewarded for their success? Well, the EPA decides to mandate now, without bothering to talk to anybody in Texas about it, to comply with the federal clean air transport rule. That's going to slam Texas and hurt jobs. The move could cost the state billions and may even cause citizens to have less, less access to electrical power. But our president is okay with that. I mean, under his plan... 
electricity rates will necessarily skyrocket. They did this despite the fact that since the 90s, Texas has had an effective clean air program on the state level. Texas officials wrote a letter of complaint to Cass Sunstein, quote, this is a significant regulatory action costing the state of Texas billions of dollars and tens of thousands of lost megawatts of electric power generation. Gee, who, who in their wildest dreams would have seen the tire iron in the spokes of our our economy and our country being cast sunstein, our regulatory and information czar. By the way, letters aren't going to affect Cass. He doesn't understand liberty the way you do, America. Why stick this federal debacle on Texas when they seem to be doing fine? Shouldn't we be asking Texas their advice during these difficult times when they've added half of the jobs one state? Are we a people that understand liberty? I contend no. We're also becoming a mobocracy. The power goes to those who have the most money. The unions that go to people's houses, even the mobs on the street. And the glue that holds this whole thing together is knowing history and knowing God. If we abandon history and God, which we've done a pretty good job of, evidenced by the miserable history scores coming from our students, and do I need to list the example of godlessness, without these, we are not indivisible. We fall apart. Are we indivisible? Well, the best way to divide people is with fear. It's what I'm accused of doing all the time. Although my predictions all seem to be warranted because they're all turning out to be right, aren't they? I want to show you what's happening again using fear. This is something new over the weekend. This is Shakira. She is a singer. She's a goodwill ambassador to the UN, and she's scheduled to visit Jerusalem for the Israeli presidential conference. Well, now special interest groups are pressuring her to cancel the trip, telling her to say no to apartheid and yes to freedom for Palestine. There's an entire website campaign devoted to her um, stopping this visit. But she's not the only one being targeted now. Over the weekend, I found out a couple of things here. A group called Americans for Peace Now has created a similar page attempting to stop my trip to Israel this August. Now, if you had to guess and you said, oh, wait a minute, this has got to be costing some money here, who's paying for this effort? Would you say it is A, ordinary concerned citizens, or B, George Soros? I actually said A at first because I didn't think George Soros would have the cojones, which I think is French for hats, to do that. But wrong again. George Soros. The Tides Foundation, supported by Soros to be exact, is given regularly to this group. Who would have seen that one coming? Then I also saw on Friday another attack from the Washington Post. Are we bothering you? Left. Is this show bothering you? Oh, wait, because you're going to pray for the days when I was only on at 5 o'clock. Oh, you'll be down on your knees going, I know I don't believe in God, but please put him on only at 5. Oh, you're going to pray for it. Anyway, the Washington Post seems to be bothered also by uh, my Israel trip. This clown who wrote this is far left guy who just trying to sell a book that sold, I think, think three copies. But anyway... To me, it's honestly amazing he still has a job because uh, it's the worst. I mean, this is, we have a very low standard for journalistic, you know, integrity at the Washington Post, apparently. But, I mean, he did the limbo under that. They are targeting in this uh, article, not me, but Joe Lieberman, because he is supporting an event in Israel. The Washington Post reporter was shocked and said Lieberman was threatening to destroy his career if he went through with it. Quote, if he shares a stage with this creature, note the Washington Post, the Washington Post has labeled me a creature. He will surrender the decency that has defined his public life. Now, even more disturbing than the um, creature part is the blatant intimidation tactic. It is, it's amazing. They're trying to intimidate everybody that wants to stand for Israel. Isn't that weird?
And in there is the out-and-out -out lie in the article that Lieberman was waffling in his support. Quote, when I spoke to Lieberman, he sounded less definite. I'm going to go. I, I don't know. He said, I I've got a lot of other things going on. I hope, I hope he finds something else to do on August 24th. As he approaches his Senate retirement, it could sh spare him a shameful end to a dignified career. Well, I called Joe Lieberman on Friday afternoon, and I apologized to him that... Um, I have done anything that would warrant his being smeared like this. I was left with the impression that Joe Lieberman is much more committed than he was before the article. There is a brave, brave man that has crossed um, and is willing to stand with somebody he disagrees with because he trusts his heart, as I trust Joe Lieberman's heart on this issue, and we will stand together. We talked about how this event can't be allowed to fail. Those are his words. I agree. There were even more lies about how I'm really just an anti-Semite who's trying to cover my tracks. Can I tell you something? If I'm an anti-Semite, I'm the worst anti-Semite the world has ever seen. I mean, I spend more time defending Israel and warning on anti-Semitism than any other show. And quite honestly, I think more than any other show, all the other shows combined against it. And we're regulars in the leftist Palestinian death threat factory, so I think we're pretty, we suck at being anti-Semitic. Don't you think, really? Jews of the world, you're safe if I'm the monster in the closet. But the attacks are coming because they need to intimidate people. You see, nudge becomes shove, and shove becomes shoot. We're entering the shove part. And it's because we won't sit down. We won't say, no, we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Throughout history, man has always been under the thumb of someone trying to crush his spirit and control him. It's either a corporation or a government, usually a, go a government, they're the worst, but it always starts small with a little Cass Sunstein, a pat down search here or paperwork there. If somebody asked me if I believe the Palestinians do, there is a plight to the Palestinians. Yes, yes, there is. I believe there is. But if people in the Middle East or around the world really cared about their plight, can I ask? I mean, I've seen Transjordan here. This is the whole land that was carved up by the UN. How about this whole? What about all that land? I mean, that whole chunk there belonged to that, so that. They carved this out of this. What do you say? Why couldn't the Palestinians just have some of that land given to Jordan? Why not? It didn't belong to anybody else. Why don't they just have that? I mean, if it was just about getting from under somebody's thumb. See, it's not. The people that they are saying that they are for are being used as a distraction so you don't pay attention to the people they are gunning down in the streets of Syria. It's happening in Syria and elsewhere in the region. No one will talk about that injustice. They just gun them down. You see, it's not about justice for all. It's about justice for some. Generally, it's the rich. It's the powerful. It's the ruling class. That's who it is. Justice for them, not for you. You are a device. Do I think there's a plight for Palestinians? Yes. Do I stand with those in Egypt that have really, truly been oppressed and do want freedom? Yes. Have we been a part of their oppression as a country? Yes. Now, do you want to solve things or do you just want more power for yourself? Man has never been freer than he is now, but it is about to slip into darkness. We haven't really been free for quite some time. And it's not about Obama or George Bush. This started over a hundred years ago. And man has been in darkness under somebody's thumb from the Assyrians to Genghis Khan to the Nazis to Mubarak. The founders believed that the natural state of man is bad when they rule or have power. That's why they had handcuffs on them. 
They knew people would be consumed with power, money, or glory. That's why we have a constitution that is a charter of negative liberties. And that's why we say one nation under God. It's his glory, not Assad's, not Mubarak's, not Obama's, nobody. His liberty and justice for all. If we don't learn that, if we don't learn that, we will be indivisible for a very short period of time. Many in the media don't even understand the importance of this last line. But the good news is we had NBC golf sports to help us remember and put it all back into perspective. We are entering a, a period now, I believe. Um, the first one was um, uh, just to jam things uh, through Congress and make them irrelevant. The second phase was make sure you have all of the uh, framework in place through Cass Sunstein's office. And now I think it is um, to set things on fire for the bottom to rise up, the top can come down. The masks are beginning to come off, something I told you would happen about two years ago, I believe. I said, watch out, these people are dangerous, and their masks will come off. Those on the far left, knows, they know that this is their opportunity. They've waited for over a hundred years to push through their agenda. And many feel that they have been used by this administration because Obama's not doing enough for their agenda. I don't believe any rational person actually believes that. but. Whether this is a political game or not, I don't know. The Washington Post has no problem publishing the words of hate-filled, proven liars who threaten and call people creatures, which sounds an awful lot like the tactics used by a regime of certain 1930s madman with a funny-looking mustache. I've, I've heard this rhetoric before, but I digress. Then you have Deepak Chopra, who is best known as, I think, any like Oprah's, you know, hippie peace-loving guru or something. He wrote one of the most angry-sounding, hate-filled rants against Sarah Palin that I think I've ever read. And that is saying something. The media seemed right now to have some sort of bizarre contest among you know, celebrities and everybody else on who can get the best hate-filled slam on Sarah Palin of the day. Chopra actually compared Palin to Chairman Mao. It's amazing. Go to glenbeck.com and read this article. Mao, you may remember, is a communist who killed millions of his own people, maybe up to 80 million of his own people. Now, I could show you some people who have praised Chairman Mao. None of them are Sarah Palin, but they all do have one thing in common. They have all worked for this administration. You know, Anita Dunn and Ron Bloom. <laughs> yeah. And then we have the latest to, I believe, have the masks start to come off. I actually feel bad for this man because he's... He's dropped the radical pose for the radical ends, and I believe in the end he's going to regret it because it's not going to work. And so he'll, the mask will peel back, and he'll become more and more angry, I believe. This guy completely lost his cool this weekend at the Netroots convention, and for a few minutes he forgot that mantra of drop the radical pose for the radical ends, his words, not mine. And he sounded like the angry radical of you know, Storm standing together to organize a revolutionary movement kind of guy. Listen. It's not just immoral, it's un-American to abuse the airways and to abuse the ears of our children with your lies and your filth. We are tired of it. We are tired of it. You're not America. You're not America. All of our children are better than how y'all act. Every one of our children act better than how y'all act. You're not America. Quit abusing our country. He's talking about those of us who work here at Fox. He's so angry that he doesn't even notice his own hypocrisy. He's supposedly angry because he's tired of being called un-American. And then he calls half the country un-American and filthy liars and child abusers. I, I don't know. I've never called him un-American. All I did was tell you what he believed in his own words. And if that makes him upset, then maybe he should consider his own viewpoints. 
That way, he doesn't have to get angry at people when they point out his own words. It was a little surprising to see the mask come off uh, for a few minutes and then, you know, him go all Howard Dean on us because Van Jones is normally really good at, again, quoting him, dropping the radical pose for the radical ends. When he toned it down, uh, he made some sort of desperate challenge to debate me. He also produced a commercial with MoveOn.org, and they're launching some campaign, and they're obviously seeking publicity for the launch. So the last thing I'm going to do is waste my time on his furthering the cause. Plus, I'm not going to waste my time with somebody who is just not honest in their own viewpoints, I believe. When Van Jones has denounced his radical revolutionary communist roots, when he really admits that he never really changed those views, he only changed tactics. When he explains his turnaround on why he was so wrong about his past views, then he might really be worth listening to at some point. Not for me, but maybe for you. You'll have to decide. Back in a minute. The final episode of this program is next Thursday. I invite you to DVR each and every episode in the next, what is it, nine shows. Tonight I, wanted you, I want you to look around at society in our own country and then around the world. It's breaking down. The question is, why? And is it spontaneous? Well, yes and no. Part of it's happening because governments go bad. Uh, when they lie to their own people, which governments always do, they have to be reset. And if they're not allowed to fail in a small failure, um, then it becomes catastrophic and they're resetting. And that's what's happening all around the world. Let's take a look at Spain. Hundreds of thousands gathered yesterday to protest angry, um, angry, they are angry at the politicians. But it's everywhere. They're angry at the politicians, they're angry at the lack of jobs. Marchers are be, uh, marches is, are being planned, leaving from multiple cities this week. Eventually, they're all going to end up in Madrid next month for what is being called an indignant rally. I'm not surprised by this, and you wouldn't be either if you watch the show every night. I warned you that it was just a matter of time before the unrest spread to Spain. Here I am. Morocco is crucial because it is the gateway to Europe. What's across from Morocco? Oh, Spain. The next logical place to go. The country that has invested a fortune in developing green jobs, which has caused it to have the highest unemployment rate in the industrialized world. I mean, I don't know how these people even, I really honestly don't know how people in, uh, on other networks, any, any journalist, can even watch this show uh, uh, with anything other than self-disgust uh, at what they've done. How many of them got the, the Spain thing right? Oh, and how about the Greece thing that I told you two years ago? There's ongoing violent, uh, violence and protest in Greece over another round of austerity measures. Everyone said it couldn't happen, and now it is again. The country needs another bailout. That won't happen. We told you it would. Another 85 billion euros to avoid bankruptcy. It's going to go bankrupt. It's going to fall. The people there have no faith. A 50-year-old unemployed father said, quote, don't be surprised if Athens goes up in flames and don't be sad either. Think of this. The country is on the verge of collapse and he isn't even upset. How did the world get to this point? In the meantime, some UK leaders are calling on the country to uh, leave the Eurozone while experts are questioning whether the Euro will survive this. It won't. Don't think it can't happen here? Well, you're in good company. Many that say now that it won't happen here or can't happen here were the ones that said it couldn't happen over there. But again, the seeds have already been sown here in America. Teen flash mob robberies now are on the rise. Police say teens are organizing online. They pick a time and a place and they go to a store, they take everything they want and then they leave before security catches them. Here's a video of a flash rob in a DC clothing store. And in Vegas, you see teens pushing their way into a convenience store. Shops on the Mag Magnificent Mile of Chicago have been targeted multiple times. In a recent survey, 95% of the 125 real re uh, retailers polled 
said that they have been victims of organized crime like this in the last year. Then, this weekend, White House Communications Director Dan Pfeiffer was booed at the Netroots conference. Even the administration's socialist friends are turning on them. That works to the advantage of anybody who wants to fundamentally transform the system. So what do we do? Well, the governments need to be reset. They do. It's unsustainable. It doesn't work. So do we just, as people, go out in the street, march, and just hope that freedom will reign after the government resets? Or do we pause for a second and make sure that we ourselves are worthy and capable of freedom? Freedom hasn't taken root in Iraq or Afghanistan. We hope that it would. I did. But it hasn't. Why? Because it's not part of the culture, freedom. The freedom that we experience here in America, uniquely an American idea. Because of these two words, under God. Our children are being taught, well, the flash mob kids, they don't see owners, the owners of these store, as people. What does it matter if they just take what they deserve from their evil rich store owners? It won't hurt them. Ye yes, it will. But that's the demonization of the greedy capitalists. But who's really being hurt? The individual store owner? The convenience store guy? Just trying to earn a decent living? Worked hard his whole life just to be able to open up a shop? They're dehumanizing people the people of the store, the owners, and the left is doing an amazing job of dehumanizing anyone who is successful or anyone who stands in their way. But these teens think it's okay to take what they want and do what they want. But it's not. In a civilized society, even if you're in desperate straits, you don't hurt others. You don't steal from others. You don't destroy others to pull yourself up. We don't have that right. Never have. We don't have the right to hurt other people. To be free is a choice, but it is the hardest of all choices because it requires responsibility. To really be free, to be a moral and just person sucks. It sucks because it's not easy to do it. But I believe that's where the Americans come in. We have always done the job that the rest of the world didn't want to do. We have always done the job that the rest of the world thought was impossible. And I believe we'll do it again. I want to ask you, not as a TV personality or... I want to ask you as a dad, as a citizen, to do your country a favor. I'll begin to explain that next. Uh, the Global Crop Diversity Trust is better known as the group that operates that seed vault that most people in the world don't even know about. <clears throat> it's a fascinating story. The vault is built into a snow-covered mountain off Norway near the Arctic Circle. And it is quite an amazing um, place. It was set up to protect crop diversity. Now, they did this in case something disastrous happens on Earth. My first thought here is, wait a minute, that sounds like somebody's preparing for the worst while hoping for the best. What fear mongers? The seed vault can hold up to 4.5 million seeds. Now, I find this interesting because the global community is busy creating hybrid seeds. Look what's happening right in our own backyard. While we're creating these hybrid seeds, we have lost over 14,900 varieties of apples in the U.S., and that's in the last 100 years. 100 years ago, there were more than 15,000 apple varieties here in our country. Now, 11. Not 11,000, 11 show up on the supermarket shelves. 11. From 15,000 to 11. Now that is an actual change in the climate of a basic food item. But nobody seems to care. But raise the temperature by 0.7 degrees over the same 100 years and the sky is falling. Shut down industry. Destroy the combustion engine. Stop capitalism. 
Another weird occurrence that is happening are the bees. The bees are dying out. Four species of bees have been basically wiped out in the past 20 years. Nobody knows why. I don't have any idea. Maybe we're messing with Mother Nature. I have no idea. Nobody knows. So we built this UN seed vault with a seed from everything that we can find in the world. It's kind of like a Noah's Ark of seeds. Who spent the money? Why? Well, what are they doing? It's not global warming crap because, I mean, if it's a hundred, you know, if it's a, if it's five degrees uh, uh, hotter around the world, you can't, you can't grow any of that stuff because it'll be too warm, right? I'm not going to ask you to collect seeds. But I am going to ask you to think about that seed vault for the next three minutes and think about what it is that it does. What is its purpose? And then I'm going to ask you to do something when we return. Oh, this summer I, oh, I have homework for you. I told you a minute ago, I want you to think of that seed vault. What is the point of that seed vault? It is to restart things in case there was a catastrophic failure of some sort. Well, what do we have? You know, we, we have the, in the National Archives, we used to, they won't verify that this is the way we do it anymore, but it used to be that those documents at the National Archives, the Declaration of Independence, they were sitting up like this, and you'd come into the National Archives and you'd see them. But because of what we used to have with the Soviet Union, we were afraid of a ground zero hit. And those documents would fall back and shoot down under the ground, and a giant vault door would close over them. It was said that we had everything to restart our society in that vault within a fraction of a second. What do we have now, really? Because I don't think that vault in the... I mean, it's not going to turn into Planet of the Apes, guys. I mean, life goes on. We have to plant the seeds of freedom, not buried someplace, but in our hearts and in our minds and in our children. I know you're probably already doing that, but I think it's time to redouble the effort, efforts. I, I think things are beginning to come undone, and so we have to double our efforts. Here's what I want you to do this summer. I want you to read history, and there's specific things that I want you to do, and I'm, I'm going to have, if you go to glenbeck.com, I will have specific things um, that you can read and groups that you can join. I want you to go to glenbeck.com and find up, sign up for our free email newsletter, or whatever you have to do, but find it. Reach out to your friends. I want you to read history. I want you to read about somebody you admire. Find that person that you think you can be like in history. It doesn't have to be the founders or anybody else. Who is it? Find out somebody that you think, man, I cannot believe the way this guy lives his life. I could never be that. And stop saying that. Accept it. And then try to be like him. This is my guy, George Washington. Stop trying so hard is the fourth one. Stop trying to convince that person in your family you're never going to convince. They're never going to give up. Give up. Surrender. It's not, it's not giving up on um, the idea or anything. It's just they're not going to come. That's okay. Move on. Move on. Surrender to them and start being more proactive in your own community. Tighten that circle a bit. Plan to think outside of the box. Ask people to join a committee of friends and family with different skills. I, I have no idea how to grow my own food. I have no idea. We're all, we're starving to death if I'm the farmer, starving to death. If I'm the military guy, starving to death. And then being robbed and being killed. Um, have to make clothes, can't do it. I have to tell you, the only thing I'm good for, I'm the, I'm the first guy eaten. I really am. I mean, I'm a little fatty, uh, but probably have a lot of flavor. Um, I have no usable skills in the real world. None. I don't know how to repair an engine. Do you? You need to be. You need to be able to repair things. We need to be truly self-sufficient. And then we need to link arms with our neighbors. I'm not saying you need to be a seed vault, 
But I'm not not saying that either. I don't think it would hurt to have a few seeds in storage someplace. I mean, the UN doesn't think so. Why would we? How many people are even prepared for a financial emergency? This is something that I talked about when TARP happened. I said, they are preparing. How many years ago was that? Three? They are preparing. What are you doing? Only 24% of consumers have recommended cushions of at least six months' expenses set aside. Most people at this point can't afford to put more aside. So what can you do? Will you can this summer? I asked you that last summer. Is it becoming more clear to anyone in your circle that that's not such a crazy idea? I read someplace today, again, another economist said, if we have one more problem with the farms, the whole thing could collapse. And I'm like, really? I thought you said that like six months ago. And it's no longer a Freddie and Fanny size problem. Is it so unreasonable to believe that when mobs stoked up by Marxist, they'll be sent to take farms because people are hungry and they can't afford food? I don't think it is. If you're a student of history and you read history, look what happened in Russia, 1919, 1920. For that matter, look anywhere, anywhere. Look at Zimbabwe under Robert Mugabe. Farms were destroyed. More than 200 white farmers were targeted and beaten. And we're talking about this happening in the last decade. Somebody needs to be there. Somebody needs to be there with skills. And we're not going to be able to relearn all of these skills and be able to have all of this knowledge ourselves. We have to be able to be a vault ourselves to make sure that American ideas and the ideals, our culture, continue under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. One nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. That brings us to this point where we started the episode today. The final episode is now eight shows away. Today, we covered this a little bit. Food prices, solutions. Food prices, store, grow, can. Do what you, do what you have to do. Don't listen to anybody else. Energy prices, that's tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we have energy executives here who say they're under attack by the EPA over overregulation by the White House is forcing them to make the tough decisions of layoffs, plant closures, and your energy prices will necessarily skyrocket. What to do, what to do. And then jobs. College, really? College students and recent graduates who are looking for new opportunities of the traditional job market is out. That's Wednesday from New York. Good night, America. <laughs>